Yeah. Yeah. That was worth the price of admission right there. Uh, how you guys doing? Welcome. Uh, welcome back or nothing like that? To see ya. Glad to have you here, Victorville. Glad to have you on board Apple Valley and Fielding as well. If you need a copy of the outline, raise your hand. It's always a pleasure to welcome you, but especially uh, this weekend. I guess I could say that every weekend because this weekend we're beginning our, our uh, journey, the journey of a lifetime, Route 66. Reading through the Bible, I know many of you are faithful for one week. Props to you. Only got 51 more weeks to go. And I'll tell you what, there are whack jobs in the Bible, right? Have you read the stories over the last 20 whatever chapters? These people need therapy. But anyway, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're able to relate, I think, to uh, what's going on there as uh, so much has already happened. And so we're excited for you. And as we've said many times already, if, if you haven't you know, got into this yet, get in any time. Every day is another on-ramp to Route 66. That's what we say, and we'd be glad to welcome you uh, on this epic uh, experience with us at any point in time. Now, uh, today we're going to begin the first of what is going to be six different series. Uh, four in the Old Testament, a couple in the New Testament later on in the year. We've broken up, the teaching team has broken up the scripture into these, these uh, series, tried to come up with some creative themes uh, through which we'd be able to communicate not just some of the content from uh, these passages that you're reading, but also the vibe behind it, some of the, the context. And uh, so I hope that what we say on the weekend, the things that you talk about in your small groups will further illuminate the journey you're taking every day because it isn't the weekend and it really isn't the small group experience that is driving this thing. It's your daily readings that we have put in the driver's seat and we're just kind of following along with what we teach and the conversations that we have in our groups. The Pentateuch, it's a Greek word and it refers to a five um, cases actually, Pentateuch, five cases. A case would be something that would contain a scroll and so Pentateuch means five volumes. The first five volumes of the Bible, the first five books of the Old Testament, a.k.a. the books of the law. And what we're going to try to do over the next several months is to talk a little bit about the social not working problems that we continue to face because of what we have already read from the first part of the book of Genesis. You know, in Genesis chapter 1, uh, you read it probably not for the first time. God created a perfect ecosystem, a perfect uh, universe, perfect cosmos, and then he uh, built this social structure that he designed for uh, our being able not only to enjoy our relationship with God, our relationship with him, but also fully maximize the relationships that we are able to share with one another. But then the fall of mankind took place in chapter 3. Again, you already read about it. And as a result, we've been struggling ever since to try to figure out how can we get back what we lost as it relates to the relationships that we share one with another. What was once created as being good, and boy, you read that in chapter 1. God would put something together and he'd just kind of stand back and say, Wow, that's really good. And then uh, day after day after day of, of this perfect creation, all of a sudden starting to come apart like, like uh, you know, a, a, a golf ball that some of you guys, uh, s you know, put some smiles on, and pretty soon it's, it's struggling to find its way down the fairway. Actually, that metaphor is not in the notes. I'm not really sure why I, I said it quite that way. Do we have any golfers in the auditorium today? Okay, so God's Spirit told me to say that because He's going to speak to you specifically today. I guess that's all we can conclude. You know, some of the narratives over the last 20-some chapters that we've read, uh, some of those narratives have been pretty compelling. And one of the things that becomes very clear throughout this sequence of curses that God dishes out 
in, in chapter 3, in Genesis chapter 3, is that what was originally designed to come naturally in life was now going to still be possible, but only through some real effort. For example, childbirth became difficult. You know, with painful labor, ladies, you will give birth to children. It's part of the curse, you know, when God was talking to Eve. That's who he was speaking to when he said that. It was still possible to give birth, still possible to deliver children, but it was going to be difficult and painful, something that our family experienced. This morning we got grandbaby number five, and we're thankful for little Camden Faith White, the first offspring of uh, our daughter Lindsay and her husband Jason and now they're in the baby derby and if we can just get um, our son and daughter lion we'll have a full court press on this thing. Cheryl and I are amassing this litany of grandchildren that we're very excited about. I don't know if massing is the correct way to describe it. That's not in the script either. But anyway, we're blessed. But, you know, it's been a difficult couple of days for our daughter as she, you know, was in those early stages of labor. And then late last night, uh, it, was, it was pretty tough. And I was not in with her, her grandmother and her sister and her husband were, but uh, they would come out and say, whoa, it was, a, it was an ordeal, all part of the curse. You can still have babies. It's going to be harder now. You know, making a living as a farmer suddenly became difficult. God said to Adam, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you'll eat food from it all the days of your life. You're still going to be able to make a living as a farmer, Adam, but uh, it's going to take a lot more work now. Because the ground isn't going to cooperate like it otherwise would have. And, and now getting along with people. Something that was designed to happen intuitively in this idyllic setting of the garden was now going to become uh, quite difficult and painful. You know, when he was talking to Eve, what did he say? He said, as part of the curse, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. I mean, there was all of a sudden this pride thing going on and even a woman's desire for her husband, some commentators would say that's kind of a sexual statement and, you know, I don't know about that, but then there are others who I think give a little better clarity when they say what, what happened at the fall is that we began looking for the wrong things from the wrong people. In other words, women, sometimes when you're married, sometimes you'll look for something from your husband that only God can provide you. And before the fall, you would have sought God for that. And he's the one who can deliver. Now, we look to one another for things that only God can give. And as a result, we become very frustrated. And relationships are, are tense. And, and we've got these relational crises going on, all of us. And that healthy, long-term relationship with people, those lifelong friendships that don't go south, but they continue to grow and develop, and they just get better and better. You know, that is still possible. But they're going to take a lot of work now. And that really is the nature of the curse. It wasn't that all bets are off and you can't do the stuff anymore. It's just that life became so hard. And having an authentic, growing healthy relationship became so difficult. And this series, this first series that we're pretty excited about, developing authentic relationships. You know, over the course of these months, we're going to discover that these five books of the law reveal a list of those qualities that create healthy relationships, qualities that we find in our Creator, qualities that He hardwired us to reflect, but qualities that took a big hit when sin was injected into our hearts. And without those qualities in play, it's easy to see why the social construct that God had designed for us to operate in uh, suddenly started to uh, simply not work. Now, in these chapters that we've just completed, God's already made some pretty cool statements about himself. And, and I want to begin with this, and it's, it's kind of an introduction of the whole Bible, actually, uh, what I'm going to say in the next few minutes. But we've just read, what, 20-some chapters, and we already know some pretty amazing things about God. First of all, we know He's perfect. Everything He made was an extension of His character. 
Once again in chapter 1, it's good, it's good, it's good. His work is so good. And it was good, his work was good because he was good. And we also learn that God is not just perfect, he's also very predictable. He created an orderly universe containing laws that make the cosmos predictable and relational dynamics predictable. There are very few surprises with God because of irrefutable laws that drive both the physical universe and the spiritual world systems. We know exactly what to expect from God every day. We should never be surprised at what God does. I, I know even on the, on, the, on the good side of life, you know, God does something miraculous, and it's like we're shocked. God is very predictable. He's a God of miracles, but he's also a moral God. And he lays out these relational systems, and he says, this is how I want your relationships to operate in order for them to be as authentic and as healthy as they can possibly be. And when we decide not to follow the rules, certain things happen, certain things break. And, and I know, you know, we got people coming to us as pastors all the time saying, you know, Pastor, what happened? Well, exactly what God said would happen happened. Because God is predictable. He's also personal. Personable. We love a personal God. Deism is a view of God that believes that God is disinterested in what happened to us. And you, you might actually know some deists. I, I think once in a while you might actually meet an atheist, but they're not quite as plentiful as deists are. And, and what they believe, what a deist believes, is that certainly God did create the universe and God, God did create uh, us. And, and then he put us here on this planet and he kind of set things up for us and then he walked away. And he kind of retreated from the affairs of life, of everyday life. And now if he's involved at all, it's only as an observer. He watches what happens, but he doesn't intervene, and he really isn't that interested. Well, if you've been reading over the last few days, you've already recognized that God is not a deist. Because God very quickly establishes himself as one who wants to have a personal relationship with you and I. God worked with us. He walked with us. He talked to us. He cares for us all because he loves us so much. He didn't warn Adam and Eve not to eat of the fruit of that tree because he wanted to keep them from having fun. What God wanted to do was to keep them from being harmed from doing anything that would cause them to certainly die as the text reads God is a loving personable God he's also a purposeful God we've already read in chapter 3 about the plan of redemption that was initiated almost immediately after Adam's fall into sin and then the last quality of God and this is not an exhaustive list of his attributes, just some observations. This is my journal. We learn that God was a peaceful God. That with God there is a sense of harmony that transcends everything that God designs. There is harmony in the cosmos. There's a harmonious relationship that God enjoys with himself. There's a, a harmony not just in the relationship that we share with Him, but the relationship that we share with each other and even the relationship that we share with the animals. I mean, just in the, the natural ecosystem of the garden, it seems as though there was perfect synergy between Adam and Eve and the animal world. You know, all those animals just kind of following there in front of Adam as Adam would name them. There was no reason for creatures on either side whether we're talking about man or animal, nobody needed to be intimidated. Nobody needed to be afraid. It wasn't until after the flood that that relationship that we had with the animal kingdom began to change. In fact, once again, if you've been reading, you've already seen that in Genesis chapter 9. You might want to turn there in your Bibles. Genesis chapter 9, in verse 2, 
And, and the, these are some of the things, you know, I'm, I'm the one who's teaching, you know, this weekend, so you're kind of stuck with my journaling reflections. So if you don't find this interesting, you know, hang on, and maybe you'll find something interesting in a minute or two. But uh, I'm looking at, at verse 2 in chapter 9, and this, of course, is, is after, you know, the, uh, the, the flood. And it says there in verse 2, the fear and dread of you, Noah will fall on all the beasts of the earth and on all the birds in the sky, on every creature that moves along the ground, and on all the fish in the sea. They are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. The dread of man would, would at that point be part of an animal psyche. There would almost be that intimidation factor. They would be afraid of us. And certainly we, in many respects, are afraid of them. And I don't know why God changed the game there. But it would be easy to speculate that in a fallen world, the only way animals would ever survive <laughs> would be for them not to trust us. Because no longer are we trustworthy. They needed to avoid mankind altogether just to survive. But my point in all of that, and even sharing that little tidbit of, of biblical history, is to once again reinforce that when God creates something, He creates it, He designs it, He desires for it, that that creation would enjoy peace. And the violence that increasingly becomes so much a part of the human journey and, and we've read about it to this point, but you guys, it gets weirder. And that violence is not of God. He is not a God who loves violence. He is a God who loves peace. You know, if war is ever holy, it is not waged to indulge our racism or to indulge our greedy attitudes. It is only indulged as a last resort to what? To reestablish peace. Peace. Because that is what God desires. That is what God seeks to do. And that was lost in Genesis chapter 3. And so now we're going to read the rest of the Bible as God seeks to reestablish peace in, in what He created. Reestablishing peace. You know, we got a little list there. Let me just walk you through it quickly and we'll try to get through this this uh, so we can get, get to the, the main thing today. But peace between God, peace between the Godhead, not even sounds weird to say because we know that God is one, but we also know that God is revealed in three persons. You may have noticed the repeated references God made to the us of the Godhead. In chapter 1, he said, let us make man in our image. In chapter 3, he said, the man has now become like one of us and you've got God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. But you know what they enjoy together? They enjoy peace. They have perfect harmony as they work seamlessly together. And that peace within or between the Godhead would not be compromised in the fall. In fact, it would only be compromised on the cross. And you remember the Son said to the Father, Why have you forsaken me? And that was the first time there was tension. As your sin and my sin, the result of what happened in Genesis 3, as our sin was carried on Jesus' broad shoulders on the cross, see, then there was a lack of peace, even among the Godhead, even with God Himself. But then we talk about peace between God and people. And that peace between God and us has been restored in Christ. Now we're getting way ahead of ourselves, but you already know that this is all part of a redemptive plan. But he alludes to it in Genesis 3 where he talks about her seed and your seed, speaking to Satan, referring to her seed, the virgin's wounded heel, did indeed eventually crush the serpent's head. Boy, that was a prophetic statement about what would happen at the cross. And what happened at the cross is that peace was reestablished between God and His people. And then between people and animals. Once again, we refer to the peace 
between the animal world and us and, and we see in scripture that will be restored in the future kingdom as the lion and the lamb will coexist without intimidation or fear. But what I, what I want to get at and what we want to get at in this series is peace between people because now as Christians reflecting back into the book of Genesis we see now experientially that in the power of the Holy Spirit the relational peace that you and I have between us can be experienced but once again now we've gone full circle if we're willing to put in the work if we're willing to put in the work it's hard to have kids it's hard to make a living and it's hard to have peace in a relationship but it's the key to authenticity you know and, and you know this I uh, this is not something I'm, I'm saying in a vacuum you guys you guys experience this every day a uh, peace in a relationship is is important and it is the key to a lasting relationship and whenever there's not peace whenever there's tension whenever there's conflict then walls are erected and weapons are stockpiled and we've got this war going on and now since humanity's fall peace is not possible between you and I without a tenacious commitment to make a relationship work you and I have to work hard to get along with each other. And it's not because, you know, there's anything really weird about us, although there probably are many things that are weird about us. But it's just because that's the nature of the fall. And we default to this laborious approach to everything that was so intuitive to us before sin entered the world. So we want to look at tenacity today. Tenacity is really the first point in this uh, list of, of different qualities that um, are important if we want to restore what we lost, relational. Tenacity is simply another way to describe unconditional love. We use that word all the time as Christians. We talk about loving unconditionally. And, and let me just frame that with the word tenacious. And, and we, we learn about being tenacious when it comes to relationships early and often in, in the narrative, in the book of Genesis. Now the dictionary describes tenacity this way. If you're tenacious, you're determined or stubborn. Say, oh, well, I'm married to somebody who's tenacious then because they're very determined and they're very stubborn. Now, it's interesting, and you're probably right, because it's interesting how what we look at, we look at tenacity as a virtue. We look at stubbornness really as a criticism. You know, that's something that is not virtuous. You're just being stubborn. No, actually, I'm being tenacious. Now, it's really the same, and, and you can use that comeback, I guess, um, but don't, don't tell them you heard it from me. I guess we're talking about the same thing. You know, when we talk about being stubborn in our opinions, really we're just talking about holding our opinions unconditionally. We're being tenacious about our opinions. We refuse to back down. The more lengthy or difficult a conversation becomes, the more determined, the more stubborn, the more tenacious. Watch this. The more unconditionally we're in love with our opinions. We root for our teams unconditionally. If we love a team, it's without condition, even if we don't like the players. I never thought I'd ever, 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 ever root for, for Manny. And, and then he put on Dodger Blue, and he was forgiven of all of his sins somehow right then. <laughs> you know? It's, it's that unconditional love for a team. It's so much a part of our identity. We just keep cheering no matter what. We unconditionally believe that money is going to bring us happiness. Now, some of us have realized that isn't true, but so many of you still believe that. No matter, no matter that it never has brought you happiness, and no matter that you don't know anyone for whom it has brought happiness, you sacrifice so many things just to make more of it because you are so tenaciously holding on to that particular view of money. Do you understand how tenacious we are in life? And that's why when people say, well, they just don't have tenacity. Yeah, they do. they got a lot of tenacity. They just don't apply it in the right places. They're tenacious about the wrong things. 
And I don't know, maybe God just gave us a certain number of tenacity genes that we can utilize. And so if we use our tenacious energy in the wrong areas, maybe we're just all, all worn out. We don't have any more tenacity energy to apply to relationships. But it is so important if we only brought that level of stubbornness that we bring to so many other things to our families, to our friends, to that group of 8 to 15 people. God is so interested in our having an authentic relationship with. And the reason why God wants us to have authentic relationships with our oikos is so that we can have authentic conversations about authentic things like heaven and hell. And yet we give up on people. We don't give up our opinions. We don't give up our teams. We don't give up our lousy theology when it comes to things like money. But we give up on people. And one of the problems, I think, is that we see relationships as contractual. Relationships are not contractual. And what I mean by that is that we enter relationships with a kind of unwritten and perhaps even unconscious prenup. Now, you know what a prenuptial agreement is. And usually, if you've got one, it's because you married somebody who's really rich. And they want to just hedge their bets. And if for some reason you don't turn out to be, you know, the faithful companion that they had hoped that you would be, you're not going to you know, take them for half their stuff because they got a lot of stuff. And so you see a lot of people in Hollywood, a lot of people in uh, professional sports, they, they ha and maybe it's not all public, uh, a matter of public conversation, but you know, after the relationship begins to go south, you are privy to some of the conversations that took place before the relationship began. And you realize, oh, they had a prenup. They had a prenuptial agreement. And, and did you know that even though you don't have one in writing and you probably didn't even have that conversation with the person that you married because you're broke and so it didn't matter <laughs> and there was no big deal at the time but the fact is it's not just the rich guys that have those you've got one with everybody that you have a relationship with you've got a, a pre-relational agreement and we talk about how important a friendship is, how important a relationship is, while at the same time we're careful to insulate ourselves from the potential of being wounded by that relationship in the future. And that's why I call most relationships contractual. And what is a contract? A contract is a conditional agreement that I make primarily for my benefit and protection. If I want to protect myself, I enter into a contract. I'll say, well, here... I know, you know, you told me that you do what you're going to do, but I just want to make sure, and so I put together this little contract, and if you just sign the contract, you know, why do you even come up with that stuff? And I'm not even saying it's a bad idea. I mean, most relationships are contractual. Uh, let's get it out there. <laughs> but we enter them, why? Because we want to be taken care of. It's generated... That attitude is generated by our primal emotion of fear, believing that if we don't watch out for ourselves, nobody else is going to watch out for us. One of the terms that you've already run across in several of some of the more dramatic stories that you've read over the past week is the term covenant. And Berit, the, the Hebrew, forms the basis of God's relationship with people. And I just want to tell you, before we even explain covenant, is that it is just a formal way of being tenacious. It is an expression of tenacity. Now, a covenant can be either conditional or unconditional, but it has one significant distinction from a contract. It's an agreement that I make primarily for your benefit. That's what a covenant is. I'm getting into this thing... Not because I want to protect myself, not because I want to serve myself, not because I want to better myself, but because I want to protect you. I want to serve you. I want to better you. I want you to be a better person. You know, I talked again, people who are getting married, and why do you want to get married? And Well, it just all these kind of bizarre explanations. And I just love it when I hear somebody say, the reason I want to marry this person is because I know God has created them to be something great and I want to help them fulfill that call that God has placed on their life. Holy mackerel. 
I mean, let's just, you know, I'm, I'm free this afternoon. Let's just marry you right now. I mean, that's just, that is just a great reason to get married. How often do I hear that? Not very often. Uh, far more often because what, I, what, 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 what he does for me. You know, how, how she's always there for me. How they're, they're always, you know, ready to, to do for me what I want done for me. Me, me. In a covenant relationship, the parties obligate themselves to better the other. And, and the terms of the agreement in a covenant, and you've already read this, so this is only new to those of you who have not been in the sequence so far. So we're bringing you up to speed. In a covenant relationship, the parties obligate themselves to the terms of the agreement under the penalty of divine retribution if they try to avoid fulfilling those responsibilities at a future date. In fact, one of the characteristics of the initiatory event of a covenant was a sacrifice. Indicating. I mean, there are dead animals with these covenants. And that indicates, and that's what they're saying, symbolically, they're saying that should one of the parties renege on their responsibility as outlined in the covenant, then they would expect God to deal with them like they treated the animal they had just slaughtered during the ritual. Covenant serious business. I'm going to be there for you. Or may God strike me dead. Now this is the interest, interesting thing, and uh, I, I think it's a feature that you should know about in the ancient world as it relates to a covenant, in terms of power or authority, when there was, um, when there was just not equity uh, between the parties, when one of the two parties was much higher in power, had more power or more authority than the other party, as would be in the case of a king, the greater party, the king, would simply declare his intent for the relationship and the lesser party would be the subject to the king, the lesser party would have no alternative but to simply accept the terms of that decree since there was nothing that the lesser party could do anyway because the greater party had all the cards. And then the lesser party would declare his willingness to conform to what the greater had ordained. But there was always a recognition that what the greater party ordained was in the best interest of the lesser party because that is systemic to a covenant now with the divine covenant and of course that's what we're talking about in the book of Genesis isn't it a divine covenant is a covenant that God makes with people and with the divine covenant the difference between the greater who is God not an earthly king but the creator of everything and the lesser human beings who are now not perfect human beings, but we are like so low now because of our sin. The difference between the greater and the lesser is so exaggerated that the covenant, and you read about it, the covenant becomes completely one-sided. Since the lesser us could not even think about undoing what this king decides to decree. And it's also completely gracious since the greater God is so great he doesn't even need the covenant for personal benefit and is therefore and note this only motivated to benefit the lesser which is us and that's the attitude that's so clearly embedded in covenant love in fact that's another Hebrew word as said and, and we read about that all the time in the Old Testament a covenant love that God has for his people. When you understand covenant, you recognize that he is so great. He doesn't need this, but he is in so much love with us that he ordains, he decrees, he covenants things because of that love. And there's just no equity here. 
Now we see that as expressed to Adam. Turn to Genesis 3. You were in 9, so you just turn left about six chapters. And in Genesis 3, verse 15... And we've already seen this passage. And God says, of course, here are the curses. And I'm going to put enmity, en enmity between you and the woman, talking to the serpent, representing Satan, and the woman, I believe, representing the virgin mother of our Savior. And between your offspring, Satan, now this sinful offspring, and hers, this one who will be born without sin. And, and he will crush your head, but you will strike his heel. It took God exactly six verses from the fall of man. I don't know, you can count them. Six verses from Adam's sin to initiate a redemptive plan that in the fullness of time and over time, now we're going to see all the way into the New Testament, in the gospel accounts of the cross, the life and death and burial and resurrection of Christ, we're going to see this redemptive plan come to fruition. But God initiates that plan six verses after the fall. Because God wanted to reignite an eternally healthy, authentic relationship with His people. And from the very beginning, we see that covenant love, that, that chesed, that, that unconditional love, that tenacity to not give up on, on the race that he created, on the human race. And then we see covenant expressed to Noah. Look back in chapter 9 again. Chapter 9, verse 14. And, and of course, after, after the flood, you know the story, whenever, God says, verse 14, whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. And there's a covenant that God makes. Now, this is so interesting to me, and I just want to process this for a minute. And then we'll get to the biggest covenant that you read about in, in the book of Genesis. But some people want to champion Adam's faith to follow through on an initiative, excuse me, Noah's faith to follow through on an initiative that he certainly didn't understand. He didn't understand the ark until God explained it. He didn't understand rain because there had never been any. He didn't understand flood. He didn't understand the utter destruction of humanity. This was all brand new to him. God said, build an ark. He said, okay. And so we look at the story of Noah, and some people look at that and they say, this is all about a man's faith. Other people look at that and they want to champion God's willingness to give humanity a second chance. Once again, elevating that idea of tenacity. That God wants to just hang in there with us. But I think there's a different divine motive for the flood. Because God knew that no matter how many times He rebooted the human race, Sin would eventually work its way back into the practical, everyday lives of people and destroy them. I believe the primary purpose of the flood was the destruction of the Nephilim. And you read about that. Those men of renown. When the sons of God and the daughters of men had children together. You see, I think that was a calculated demonic strategy to try to bypass the redemptive plan that God already engaged in chapter 3, verse 15, to save the human race from our sin. And I believe that particular end run was generated by the enemy to somehow engineer a hybrid creature, half human, half angel. And I know that sounds like X-Files kind of stuff, but it's still what I think. And whether I'm right or not, you know, I guess I'll never know, at least not on this side of eternity. But the rainbow was a sign of God's tenacity. 
And if I'm right, the rainbow is a sign of God's tenacity to never give up on humanity. No matter what Satan throws at us, no matter even if he tries to re-engineer us genetically, God will put an end to it because he has committed himself to us to not just exist with us, but to redeem us and have an authentic relationship forever with his people. And then we see that covenant expressed to Abram in chapter 15. In chapter 15, God tells Abram to get three animals. And he says, cut them in half and arrange them on opposite sides of each other. And God walks through that bloody half, those, those bloody halves of those animals. And he is signifying that he unconditionally loves Abram and that he would unilaterally fulfill his promises because God's the only one walking between those animals. Remember I told you that there is sacrifice connected to covenants? And God is saying, I, as I am God, and as long as I am alive, I am going to be committed to you, Abraham, and to your descendants. And, and you say, really, was it unilateral? Well, yeah, Abraham was, remember, he was asleep the whole time. This was God working, symbolically identifying his tenacious love for Abram, his covenant love for his people. And that covenant love dominates the conversation all the time. You see, God knew what was waiting for Adam and Eve. We talk about the Adamic covenant, the covenant with Adam. God knew what was waiting for Adam and Eve. Only two children into their family legacy, and they've got a homicide on their hands. Within days of finally exiting the ark and initiating this new chapter of history, Noah and his sons, do you remember that story? They got this weird kind of sicko thing going on that the text doesn't even want to touch. The text doesn't even want to explain. And the behavior of Abram and his descendants, you've already read about his faithlessness. Clearly not reflecting the kind of faithfulness to their God who was so tenaciously showing his faithfulness to them. You see what's going on here? What God is doing is he is leading the way and he is providing a blueprint for our relationships. In fact, Jesus later, in discussing this convert, having a conversation, discussing this issue with his heavenly father, he said, Lord, I want them to experience the harmony that we experience together. But it's going to require a covenant approach to relationships instead of a contractual one. But this is the thing about the Old Testament covenants. They foreshadow a new and improved covenant. And you really can't have a conversation about the Old Testament covenants unless you turn to Luke chapter 22, verse 20. And there Jesus... is providing this last supper with the fellas. And it says in verse 20, in the same way after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Now remember a few minutes ago I told you there's always a sacrifice attached to the inauguration of a covenant. And Jesus is describing his own blood as sealing this particular covenant. You know, you've read that, and you have probably, um, just because you've been a Christian most of your life, or at least for a good part of your life, and, and you've read that, and you've heard pastors use that particular verse, especially when we talk about communion, it's just part of your vernacular. But you have to understand what we have been reading together in the book of Genesis, and what it means to have covenant with God. What it means to serve a God who is tenacious. What it means to serve a God who refuses to give up on people. Before Jesus came, God had set this plan into motion. And when Jesus comes, he is now resurrecting the idea of covenant. He says essentially to these guys who are all Jews, they all read the Pentateuch. They all knew all about Adam and Noah and Abraham. And God said, you know all about covenant, right? Well, those covenants only foreshadowed this new and improved covenant that is now being delivered in the person and work of Jesus at the cross. And then you look over at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. It says that Jesus has made us 
competent as ministers of a what? Of a new covenant, not of the letter. It's not a matter of what's written on the agreement. Because when God makes a covenant with us, we break it. He doesn't break it, we break it. How will it ever get to the point where we will actually fulfill the covenant that God establishes and fulfill so faithfully on, on His end for us? How will we ever get there? Well, here Paul says, He made us competent, competent. Boy, that's a loaded word. Competent as ministers of a new covenant. Now we can do it. That's all it means. But it's not of the letter, but of the what? The Spirit. Because now that we're in Christ... Now that the Holy Spirit has come into our lives, has indwelt us, and now fills us, now we have the opportunity to experience together authentic relationships, peace in relationships, peace in the relationships that you and I share with one another that reflect the peace that God shares within himself, that we experienced and enjoyed in the garden. We can get it back, you guys. It's going to take work because of the curse. But it's possible. It's possible if we're tenacious. Like God. Just three questions. I just want to ask you three questions. We'll let it go. I, do you recognize the difference between tolerance and grace? How can you learn to demonstrate the kind of tenacity that God has shown us in His covenant love? Do you know the difference between tolerance and grace? Tolerance believes that everything someone does somehow okay. We hear that all the time in counseling. And we try to bring peace in a relationship where there's been sin. It's just a little microcosm in your life about what's been happening in the entire Bible. It goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. Chapter 3. And you know, one member of the party, of the contract, says, oh, I suppose that that's sin now. We're just going to brush it under the carpet now. It's no longer an issue now. That somehow what they did is okay. What they did is not okay. And I want you to know, you don't understand the difference between tolerance and grace. I agree what they did is not okay. It's not okay. Tolerance is not required to be tenacious in a relationship. But grace is required. Grace doesn't say what they did is okay. Grace hangs in there with someone in spite of the fact that everybody knows what they did is not okay. That's the difference, guys. That's part of the new covenant. It's a covenant of grace. It's not written in the law. It's written by the Spirit in our hearts. And tenacity will always require grace in a relationship to exceed the truth that you know about the person you want to love. Where truth abounds, grace must abound even more. Second question, do you see the relationship as a bridge to personal growth? See, that's different than personal happiness. Remember, the covenant's not designed to meet your needs. In as much as you, you might even consider yourself in the relationship to be the greater, like you're the king. Someone else in the relationship is the lesser. But remember what the covenant was built on. It presupposed that the greater had the interest of the lesser in mind before the covenant was even sketched out. Relationships become vehicles to serve, not to be served. To love, not to be loved. To be faithful, not to receive faithfulness. So if you got married to have your needs met, that's why you are where you are today. And that's why it, you need a check up from the neck up. And then our, here's one. Are you willing to die before you give up on the relationship? That whole idea of sacrifice in a covenant. You know, we say this on the stage when we get married, till death do us part. That's, that's why we, we establish the marriage covenant before we really know what we're getting into. And you can date for a while, and I hope you do. I hope you do the premarital class or go through a process. The more you know, the better. The more you know before you get married, the more you can work on before you get married. Bottom line is, about two weeks after you get married, that's when the lights go on. <laughs> and that's why you made a covenant a couple weeks earlier. 
till death will we part. Why? Because that's what a covenant is. You're in this thing for the long haul. Because this is not about your happiness. This is about your personal growth and becoming like Christ. That's what makes the covenant love that God showed us so amazing. Did you know that even before he established the covenant, he knew everything about you? He knew your past, your present, and your future, and he still committed himself to you? Committed himself to fulfilling the purpose of history, to reconnect what was disconnected when Adam and Eve were forced out of the garden in your life, to actually establish a relationship that is authentic, that is based on truth and grace in Christ. He's so tenacious, isn't he? So just don't give up. You want to be godly? Don't give up. That's your homework. Let's bow for prayer. Thank you, Father, for uh, giving us a chance to just debrief, kind of work through a little uh, journal work uh, today. And I pray that what we have shared would be amazingly helpful as you build bridges relationally that might have been fractured in the past. Would you reconstruct them? Would we work on those relationships? Would we seek to fulfill the call that you have placed on us to be ambassadors, to be agents of relational authenticity and wholeness because you have given us that ministry You've made us competent of showing covenant love to the people around us. Not a covenant based on the letter, but on the Spirit, because it's the Spirit that gives life. And Father, we thank you for that. If there's anybody in the room that doesn't know God, through Christ, He is tenaciously seeking you. That's why you're here. You're not here as a matter of you know, cosmic accident. You are here by divine appointment. God wanted, I guess, to show you that He loves you that much. And if you'll admit, believe, choose, A, B, C. Admit that you, like Adam, are a sinner. And if you will believe and embrace that belief in Jesus, the son of the virgin, her seed that died for you, and choose to place your faith completely in him, you will have eternal life. And you will have temporal life that is far more compelling than anything anyone else could offer you. And so it's not just eternal. It is also temporal. I, I don't say this, you need Christ, because you might die tomorrow. I say this because I think you're probably going to wake up tomorrow. And you're probably going to have to live tomorrow. And with Jesus as your advocate, your life will connect dots you've never known could be connected. And so if you'll admit that and believe that and choose that, he'll radically change the game for you. And Father, as you seek to use us this week, make us agents once again of Hased, covenant love. In Jesus' name, all God's children said, and then all God's children said, I've got to leave my welcome form in the basket, and we'll see you next time.